what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is SPTV. Hi, everyone. We're back. Hi, Lily. Hi, Mikey. How are you? A little, little sick. Old still? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, forgive me. But I'm here. I would not miss this. I know. I know. Yeah. Me either. Yeah. And we have a a super special guest today. Um, I don't know if all of you have watched the interviews that Claire Headley and I did with Mike Brown about his mother, Rosemary. Um, they uh, tell a, a story that is so incredible, it's hard to believe that it really is true. And at the time, I... Uh, said when we were when we were doing the show, you know, I didn't really want to put Rosemary through the torture of having to recount that whole story, which is why Mike was speaking sort of on her behalf. Uh, but subsequently, Rosemary and Mike reached out to me and said that Rosemary would very much like to talk to us, uh, and so. We have her with us today, Leah. It is, uh, I, like, to me, this is like an incredible honor. Yeah. <laughs> like, a little overwhelmed by it, actually. Yeah, yeah. I love that, Lori. Okay, she is so. A special, special woman. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's bring in Rosemary. Okay. Rosemary, hi. <laughs> hi, Rosemary. Hi. Thank uh, you for I, I joining think... us. It's yes. so great to be here. Wow, I can't believe it. Well, I was just telling everybody that I had said, well, you know, I didn't really want to put you through this, but then you and Mike reached out and said you'd really like to come on. And we, we won't make it go an hour and a half or two hours like we did with Mike. We'll keep it as brief as we can. But we're so happy to have you speaking not just to us, but to the world, to everybody that watches and all the people who who have, you know, relatives in similar circumstances or who don't have any hope that anything can can change in the circumstances of those people. So thank thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Anyway, I'm just delighted to be here and I wanted you to know that I love all of you guys for helping me like Leah and Mike, your, uh, Leah, your book. I read it before I got out and it totally helped me. And then I listened to all your podcasts, like all 80 of them while I was still in there. And it I mean, just kept peeling the onion. You know how we talk about peeling the onion. Yes. <laughs> and then, and then when um, I watched Going Clear video, then it it was the one that really made me click that I was in the I was in the wrong place. I had to get out of there. Right. So uh, that's when when I reached out to Mike and he helped me get out of there. I can't believe it. But it was with you, Leah, your book, and Mike, and Leah both your podcast that it really helped me to start coming, you know, deprogramming myself when I was still in there and I was just laying in bed dying, really. Right. You know that, that, cause I, I watched both interviews and I wanted to say, because you were in the Sea Org for, you know, three decades, over three decades yeah. and uh, you were uh, not at a Scientology facility, but you were still in, meaning in your mind, yeah. You were still a member of the Church of Scientology, even though you weren't living and working in the Sea Org. You were still in, which I think some people go, well, if she was out, why would she not leave? Because it's still, it's it's what Lawrence Wright's book what is, right? Prison of Belief. Yeah. It's a perfect saying <laughs> for all of us, even if we're out, right? That yeah. it's, it's still a prison uh, in your mind. And so... I, I wanted to ask you as you were sitting there, Rosemary, because I know the first time that I went on the internet when I was still in, it was a scary moment for you, right? Because you thought this is against yeah. everything that I have ever known. Exactly. 
It was what like was going a, through your mind. What was like, I what was, was thinking the first panic. moment? Well, I wanted to just gobble up all the information because yeah. like I was away from the base. So yeah. I had, you know, sort of a quiet space in my room. And yeah. Mike, Mike, my son bought me a headset because um, that way they would just think that I was listening to music or something. But I was listening to your podcasts and your books or like your book, Mark's book, Jenna Miscavige's book. I listened to all those before I got right. out. Right. But every day I would get, when I look for your podcast, it should put out each day. <laughs> and I would w listen to those. Yeah. And I was thinking, what was your question? What What was I thinking about? Yeah, like, were you scared? Because I know I was, right? I mean, like when I first started looking. Well, I was right? scared. I was, yeah, I try to yeah. keep it a secret. You know, because any time yeah. anybody walked in, I didn't know it, it could be the MLO. She could show up out of the blue or anything. Right. But there were other old Sea Org members in there, and I didn't want any of them to know I was doing that. Right. So it was, I was sort of like a, a, a spy, you know, behind enemy lines, sort of. I don't know what to say. That's how I sure. felt. Yes. And then and, uh, I want to ask you too. Did you talk to the other Sea Org members that were there at the facility that you were in? Did you guys ever say like, what this is, you know, we served, we dedicated our lives to this and, and we've disconnected yeah. from our families. We, and, and we're now here on our own without our families with no kind of like, this is, this is what, this is it for us. No, no conversations no like that would right. ever take place. First of all, the people that were there, most of them were, they had dementia and they, yeah. they just still keep doing their same routine stuff right. that they did for 40 years or whatever. Right. You know, like this one old lady that I used to live, worked with and she was in my facility. She was still put on her, her like her badge and everything like she was going to work like her sea org like uniform? she uh yeah wow and she like you know because you have like a thing that you wear around your neck yeah. so that you can get in and out of the doors and she would put that on every day oh and her say, land, i'm gonna like go to work her parents lanyard like her security yeah. lanyard uh -huh. oh my god like they still think that they're in and they're still searing members and Right. And then they would bring over stuff for us to fill out envelopes and stuff for promo and things like that to it's still keep us working. Right. So you want no conversation like that ever would take place because right. they're all still in and you're brainwashed and you wouldn't even think about saying anything like that. <laughs> Rosemary, you just reminded me of something that I know Mike mentioned. I'm not sure if we had it. Um, we covered this, but were those people with dementia being regged for money? Yeah, there was this old lady that was, her name was Ilona Gallup. I don't know if you know her. No. She wouldn't get regged for money, but she would get uh, like a pension from her husband each month. And she would just go and give it to the IAS. They would come and get it, get her, get the check. And she would just give it to them. And I kept saying to my senior, I said, why don't you put that? This was stupid, but I'd say, why don't you put that towards her going up the bridge? Cause I didn't even know what dementia was. Right. That was when I was still a, you know, a um, extension course supervisor. And I would see her come in and have, you know, my senior would help her get that all arranged with the IS. But, Unbelievable. Uh, uh huh. But oh, anyway, so I, <laughs> there's no there's no bottom to the That's to the, the well thing. of insanity. You know that re that letter that I wrote. I think that's yes. the biggest thing that I would like to um, hope that Scientology changes for the people that still decide they're going to stay in there. I think their life would be better if that changed, you know? Yeah. Um, oh, 
<laughs> Without doubt. I mean, you list a lot of things in that letter. That is not a short letter. No. That is a lot of things that you feel are abusive or wrong in Scientology and the Sea Org that you're saying, please change this. And, you know, for anybody that reads that letter, you will see that it's a very heartfelt plea to make things better for those who are still there. So yeah, I, I, I thought that was amazing. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about that. I mean, Rosemary, if you don't mind, I know you uh, just to, just to give a, a bullet point to people maybe who haven't seen the interviews that you did with her son, Mike, but Rosemary was in the Sea Org for 34 plus years. Right. Um, right. I had to disconnect from her son, Mike, who's sitting next to you. Mike, if you want to give a little wave, stick your head in there. Yay. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you got sick, uh, were sent to the hospital. Scientology was not taking care of you, as it doesn't its Sea Org members. And it's, it's elderly. It's sick. Um, they stick them away into, you know, what you would I, I wouldn't define it as hospice, uh, but um some their form of a care facility, which for Rosemary was a someone's house in, in a residential neighborhood that had no medical resources. It was just a homeowner who decided to open up a business. I'm sure there's some regulations. Mike, I don't I don't know if that's true, but it didn't sound like there was a whole lot of oversight going on, but mm -hmm. Scientology was sticking at Sea Org members there. Mm -hmm. And even though you were in, you know, hospice, you still were not allowed to be connected to your son, Mike. Right. Uh, who was across the country, 3,000 3, miles away. Uh, but he did get a call from the hospital or somebody. I don't, I don't know if it was the hospital that you were indeed in the hospital and now in aftercare. And your son, it was very my smart. Son, my brother. Yeah. My oh, your brother. brother called it. Yeah. And your son very smartly gave you a phone uh, and uh, uh, a device, a Kindle, right? Was it a Kindle or, no. a, or an iPad? He didn't give those to me. He wasn't there yet. Oh. The, the, the medical officer gave it to me because I was wanting to go back to the base and they didn't want me to go back to the base because. I might die and they don't want me to die on the base. Right. What, so would, that, what me, would that mean? What would that mean? If you died on the base, that would mean that people, well, that died? would mean that they, that would mean that the, uh, emergency squad would have to come in there and get me out. Okay. You know, like an ambulance would have to come and they don't want anybody to come in there and see how they're living in there. Got you. Okay. So to protect yeah, Rosemary was, in one of those dorms for elderly women with like 12 other women in yeah. stacked bunk beds who were right. incapacitated. I mean, I think so if, if, if somebody did come in, they would shut it down basically. It's right. Like this is elder abuse. It, yeah. It would right. be yeah, they don't a want flap. anybody to come in the rooms. It'd be a flap. Got you. Okay. And so the, the person you're calling a medical officer is no such thing, but it's just a yeah. title that Scientology gets. So a Scientology staff member gave you a device that you were yeah, able she, to then go ahead, sir. She gave me the, it's called a, a kin, a um, Kindle. Uh -huh. It's like a little flat thing. Uh huh. And um, her husband had passed away. So she gave it to me okay. and she put some icons on there for me to watch Scientology um, Propaganda. Yeah, you know, different things like do the congresses or whatever on there. Oh, so, so they that I would shut so up. They were really torturing you, Rosemary. Well, they were wanting to shut me up so that I didn't want to come to, back to the base because well, I kept you, calling. You should have. You should have put on the Scientology channel. You would have never wanted to go back. That's what they should have done. <laughs> anyway, so that was. But what I ended up doing was poking around into the internet. And then I found stuff about L. Ron Hubbard and different things that were not good. And I started <laughs> thinking, gosh, those are, that's like different than what I thought. Right. And so 
I just kept doing that. And then Mike, you know, got me connected with the Netflix and the, I, you know, yeah, your podcasts and then told me about your books. And I just kept doing all this stuff. And by, and when I came to the end of it, because I'm in this place all by myself and I don't really have anybody bothering me that I can't do it. I kind of just deprogrammed myself and I thought, I got to get out of here. I'm like in the wrong. This is crazy. Isn't that amazing <coughs> yeah. how quickly it happens, Rosemary? Like, you know, I always say this, and Mike has said this too, like it's the quickest deprogramming known to man. Like some people, like, you know, it takes them a long time. It only takes a good eight hours just to get, you know, you watch Going Clear, you watch our series, you watch other, you know, you read books from people who've written, but and you're like, you're, you're, you're like this. This is not at all what we, we lived in a bubble, because mm -hmm. I had done that too, Rosemary. I was like, I want to see what people saying about us and L. L Ron Hubbard, and yeah. I couldn't find anything that were showing at the events or in like anything. I was like, there's nothing uh, reminiscent in the real world. So if we're make, having we're creating all these effects. Like it's not getting to the real world at all. I know. So anyway, like, um, the first part of it though, was me listening to the, to your podcasts uh -huh. and, and knowing people that were on there, like Jeff Hawkins and different right. people that I worked with right. and just the stories of that. Like it, it took every day I would do it over and over again. Right. And then, and then listen to your book, listen to Mark's book, like I said, and Jenna's book. Yes. And then, um, and then the Netflix, he gave me all those yeah. uh, to watch. But the biggest thing that I still had to get rid of was I'm thinking, I still believed in LRH. Right. Like it was all this stuff. Right. But I still was holding on to that until right. you get rid of that part that the whole thing, crumbles down as soon as you realize that LRH is a big piece of shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> I do. And, and, I do. and what just such, caused that for you, Rosemary? Yeah. Watching that going clear documentary. When mm -hmm. I watched that, I, I could remember I went outside with my, and I'm in, with my walker and I'm walking. They would only let me walk in front of the house. And I thought, Oh my God. I got to get out of here. I just felt like running down the street. Right. You know what right. I mean? I was thinking yes. I was. And um, until then, I was still hanging on to this hope about L. Ron Hubbard. Right. And then when I was able to see L. Ron Hubbard for what he was really, you know, because I always thought he was ugly and I thought he had bad teeth and right. all this stuff about him. But I would never say that because I thought, well, maybe right. it's a bad picture or something. And then I was able to see the truth. I don't even know. It was sort of like you finally came to came to, and that's right. what happened to me. And right. it was be, all because of my son giving me all this slowly and gently. He wouldn't even push me to do it. He'd just say, oh, I had something else. If you want to watch it, you can. If you don't, and I would just gobble it up. You know, right? And, um, had he been forceful with you, yeah. it would have probably had the opposite effect. Do you think? I would probably, yeah. You're because you're sort of like a little wild, you know, when you're trying to tame a little rabbit or kitten or something. When you they're <coughs> you're easily frightened from things, and yeah. if you just do it on your own at your own pace, right. That, that's how you have to, you can't be pressured. And he never did pressure me. One bit, he was so gentle with everything. He just put it there. If I want to read it, okay. If not, and I would just, as soon as he'd leave, I'd get into you it would, and read and get into the whole thing. Yeah. Cause that's been somewhat frustrating. What would you say to people who, for example, like the way Mike went about it, Mike, your son, went about it with you saying, look, if you want to, you know, look at that, most 
Scientologist, even on the fringe, would say, why would I look at that? That's in theta. Why would I want to look at those things that's in theta? What advice would you give to those people who are saying that? I don't know. Um, what advice I would give them? Mike, I just, Mike, th- Mike, you seem to be the expert on this. Why don't you weigh in? Because I think we need to hire you as the cult expert of Scientology. Because <laughs> Mike no Brown. Been able to handle Which, Mike, we're, we're, we're yeah, at an Mike affluence Brown. on Mike's. Mike Brown. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not. I'm not Mike the expert. B. On yeah, this. Mike's not the expert. I, neither um, am I, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of in here in the frame with mom. So I'll just I'm just going to, I'm little. just, <laughs> hi, Mike, I'm just going to change this so okay. that we can see you better if I can get my computer to work. Sure. And I, and, and I want to, of course, give the floor back to mom, but um, there we yeah, go. Yeah. And, there we go. And I'm trying not to just kind of tower over her. So uh, forgive <laughs> me if I'm kind of, you know, coming into the edge here. So the, the main thing that I remember when I was there is you have all these very strong beliefs that you've invested yourself in very heavily yeah. through time, through your you know investment of what your life's work is or monetarily and for Sea Org Public, which as a Sea Org member, that's not really the case, but your, you, your life's work has been there. So yeah. for you to just invalidate all of that all at once, it's it felt devastating for me coming out, realizing that I had wasted, you know, the better part of my um, early years that I could have been doing something else with my life. So having that all crumbled down, I didn't want her to have that, (laughs) but I wanted her to also have the ability to look at things for themselves. Scientology loves the phrase, think for yourself until they have to do it themselves because they'll say that, but they don't really mean it. They really mean think what we tell you to think. Well, that's what I, that's what I said to people like who have given me that kind of like, why would I look at that? It's in theta you know, like with the Debbie Cook email, it's like I was asking Scientologists at the time, you know, I read it. I said, why haven't you read it? They said, why would I look at that? It's in Theta. I go, well, the world's in Theta. If you don't, if you, if you can't confront in Theta, then, then what the fuck are you doing in science? What are we doing if we can't confront fucking in Theta? And, and these are OT8s by the way. And, um, uh, she said, no, I'm not going to look at anything that attacks my church. I said, you know, but, but why can't you just read the email? I just can't understand why you can't read an email being right. OT8 and a classed auditor. Uh, so just look at the email. And it was I, – I just couldn't get her to read the email. Um, so, and it's very difficult to get through because I kept saying, can't you think for yourself, right? Isn't that mm-hmm. the slogan of, of Scientology is mm-hmm. that – we make our own decisions and we, but yet we make none of our own decisions. You can't even read an email without, uh, you know, thinking you're going to die, you know, like a, a combust from looking at anything. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like what, 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 how are you thinking for yourself if you're not allowed to ask a question, which is part of uh, L. Ron Hubbard's PR policies, right? Is, you know, answer the question, answer the public's questions. That's like rule number one, but yet we don't answer any questions. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that in general, we're, we have a change in the public perception on how they want information presented. And I'll give you an example. All the information uh, five years ago used to be cable news, which are these little sensational sound bites. And whatever you get, you have to get it in between two to five minutes, and that's all you get. And more and more people are leaning more towards a long format, nuanced conversation where it's not an argument as much as it's just a discussion. You can have two right. people that have vastly different opinions and we have that a lot in the military. You have people from all walks of life. They get right. together and it's a melting pot of people and information and cultures. And you right. learn very quickly. You have to communicate with other people, be respectful of your views, but also be willing to talk through those things. And what's well, strange about a, Scientology, they can never do that. No. Well, yeah. that's not a They talk about confront, but they... All. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. Anyway, so right. I, I guess I'd changed. I'd been out long enough because I'm right at about 20 years that I've been out. And this would have been about, you know, 17 and a half, 18 years when we started working through this, right. that we were able to start to, you know, just slowly have the conversations. And, you know, we're geographically separated and she's, right. it's either by email or me when I'm driving home, I'm calling her on the phone right. and just listening to what she has to say, because now she's in a great place where she can, she can complain about the things she wasn't happy about. That's also something you can never do. So the people around you, you think it's only you if you have a complaint or if something's in your head and you just, you keep tamping it down. So now she could natter like, Hey, I I didn't like that. You know, I was living like crap and my money was being taken from me. Like, yeah, I had $180,000 stolen from me, by the way. (laughs) 
Uh, yeah, you know, that, that's another part of the story is that uh, they they stole uh, a significant amount of money and then just randomly paid it back to you, put it in your bank account, which how they found out your bank account, how they were able to do that is you guys covered that in your interview. But I found that really astounding and that they didn't want to go through a lawyer, of course. And I, mm-hmm. you know, and other than that, I'm sure they didn't add uh, the interest that that was due you uh, either. Right. But- so. <laughs> well, all of that and all of the potential, yeah. like normally, and this is what all of these elderly Sea Org members that are still there are forced with. Normal person yeah. goes through life, they accumulate, you know, wealth and things. They then, you know, downsize, they sell their home, they get a reverse mortgage or whatever it is. And okay. then you have your retirement. In the Sea Org, they don't have anything. And then they're yeah. taking money from their elderly. So not only did she they take all that money but the normal process of just investing it the way people would that money would have been double what it was just over the time that they were taking it exactly. let alone being able to have a normal pension <laughs> and uh money that they would be putting away for someone's you know golden years which isn't even a concept in um in the sea organization so I, I, I don't want to i don't want to hijack the uh, communication too terribly no, much, but... out of there. i can't talk like <laughs> All right. I'm okay. Gonna you're, you're going, this, you're going back to purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right here. Mike, I did want to say, I did want to say one thing to you. Cause I don't, um, I just, um, that I was really touched by you, uh, by you fighting for your mom. Well, thank you. Yeah. It was, yeah. um, it, there, I'm going to cry because I'm like, oh, it's so well, rare. It's so rare in the world that we are coming from that you fought for your mom. And that your mom, you, Rosemary, fought for yourself, you know, really says a lot about the two of you, your character. Yep. So, Same. yeah, I no, think we've, really. We've yeah. been given a rare opportunity that I want other people to have. Same. Um, I, I, I hope that this story really shows people, because I know you guys said, like, at the end of you, you know, you guys are setting the message, right? It's like, hey, fight for your family. You know, they yeah. need you. You know, your kids need you to fight for them in the Sea Org. Your mothers, your fathers, they need you to fight for them. Like, uh, they're there and they are not being taken care of. They're being abused. And, you know, that's the message that you two are sending is to fight. Uh, and that's so important. And other than this fight, Mike, thank you for your service in general. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Um, you you have no idea, the two of you, how much of a... Uh influence you've had on the general population. So yes. a lot of the people that I work with, uh, and their spouses, um, I just went to a doctor's appointment yesterday and I was, you know, <laughs> mentioned something and all of a sudden it's like just a random person. They're like, Oh yeah, I follow Leah Remini all the time. <laughs> oh, you know, her co-host Mike. And this is just a lady <laughs> in the middle of Pennsylvania. Like I love it. They, it's all over. So this is really part of the fabric <laughs> of uh, yeah. the culture now where people are very interested in this conversation. And yeah. I want to provide, I want to provide this information, uh, not so it's sensational for us because it's an important, you know, we have a good news story <laughs> to share and there's still a lot that we need to be able to kind of bring forth and deal with specifically yeah. for mom's abuse. But she's one yeah. of dozens, if not hundreds of other elderly that are in the same yeah. situation. Yeah. Right. Well, we're, we're here to support you, Mike, in everything that you do. So whatever you're doing, you let us know, and I'll support anything that you're doing to further this message. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Of course. All right, get out of there, Mike. All right. Okay, he's gone. <laughs> he's gone. Um, I, I just wanted to, to add one thing to what we were just talking about on how do you go about deprogramming someone and it's something that that rosemary said that sort of made me think a bit one of the things that i think is is incredibly important and probably uh was important for you rosemary is the fact that when you have you know you sort of pluck up the courage to take a look at some of these things or listen to a podcast or watch the aftermath or going clear or whatever you yourself a, like you said, see people that you knew. Yeah. And that is, is incredibly important in my view, not just because you knew them, but because when they talk about their experiences, you go, well, yep, I saw it myself or that happened to me. 
Yeah. And when you <laughs> then compare the other things that they have to say that you may not have seen, but you give it a lot more credence because you know that that their experiences that you have shared or that you have witnessed, they're telling the truth about. So why would they be lying about anything else? So, Rosemary, you may not have seen David Miscavige physically assault someone. I don't know. Maybe you did. You probably I did. did but yeah. Okay. I saw but, him do it to you. I, uh, okay. There you go. But I know so that, I, I'm trying to use this as, an, as sort of an example. <laughs> but, you know, Rosemary, unfortunately or unfortunately, has experienced a lot of things that I also experienced. I mean, you know, she's seen a lot that I saw and yeah. Jeff Hawkins and yeah. other, the other Tom DeVocht and the other people that we all know who were at the base where Rosemary was. But this, this, um, so you just sort of triggered a thought with me about if you can communicate to someone that the person that, they that they're going to hear from is someone who has shared experiences or you may know or is in a similar position to you it gives them a lot of credence <clears throat> and I, I think that people will tend to listen more to what those people say and uh, that was just something that popped into my mind that i wanted to make mention of because you talked about Jeff Hawkins and seeing Jeff Hawkins and hearing him on the podcast and other people you knew. And I went, yeah, I guess that's pretty powerful. It because is. Because you know those people. You know what they went through. <laughs> you know and have experienced similar stuff. And then I'm going, oh, my God, they're out. You know, just, so they're on, you know, they must, something must have happened. Right, you know, right, and so and you didn't know that, right, Rosemary? You and didn't I didn't know, know that. that. No. Yeah, yeah. And if you were, if you asked about Jeff Hawkins or Mike Rinder, if you even asked as a Sea Org member, hey, what happened to Mike Rinder, or Jeff Hawkins? You would probably told they <laughs> were on mission, right? That that you wouldn't even oh, be told the truth. Well, we found out about. I was on the RPF when oh. I found that Mike Rinder is not is on the other side he's on the the dark side that's what they would say and i go oh my god well i guess i won't have to do any more overts and withholds that i did against mike render anymore then right you know because <laughs> it's so ridiculous right you know because every time you go in session it's got you you know you have to do your roots and anyway anything can come up Right. So, yeah, we were like covering overs and withholds on Mike Render. That's for sure. You know, but you were we told wouldn't... you were told that he was an SP. Did that strike you as odd? <clears throat> no, odd. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe it. You know right. that, he, that, that you weren't Mike. there anymore. So then it's making me so clear. Back then, I'm thinking, what happened to Mike that he left? You know, right. but then you're like crazy all day long they make you change your mind about what you're you thought about that and then you just keep going on and on and right. never know what happened to mike render right but and they, you don't, they and, just said that yeah. you were an F sp <laughs> well they yeah. were right well, yeah well apparently they were I right, right. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right um and now I'm an SP. I love now it. Now you're an SP. Everybody's an SP. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that, yes, you're an SP. You're an SP. You're an SP. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna send you an SP bracelet, Rosemary. Okay. We have those, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Mike Mike Brown has one. <laughs> by the way, and by the way, who started that? Did Mark Headley ever give me yes. credit for that? Oh, he uh, did. No, he didn't. He didn't you give me credit right, for that. It. He took yeah. credit for it himself, of course. You're so. damn right. Now, <laughs> yes. When when Mark, I got Mark that bracelet. I remember. Left, and then he made it. Yes. And then he yeah. went off and made it. Yeah. I remember. No, yep. You know, Rosemary, you just can't get a break with these guys. You know, they just... <laughs> uh, but I wanted to go over this uh, what, one thing. I The bullet points of your letter. You wrote a letter to David Miscavige, to Tom Cruise, and to Kevin Huvane, 
through, well, you wrote it to Kevin Huvey, which is uh, Tom Cruise's lawyer at CA. He's probably agent. one of the agents. Sorry. He's a, he's one of the <coughs> biggest agents in the entertainment <coughs> business. He, he yields a lot of power. Um, mm -hmm. And so you smartly send it to Tom Cruise through Kevin Huvane and to Dave Miscavige. Do you have the letter, Mike? I do. Oh, um, I just you want me to, to pull over. the letter up? Please. I, I just can. wanted to go over, Rosemary, the bullet points of your letter. If mm -hmm. you have it. I don't know, Mike. Do you have it, Mike B? I, I've got oh, it yeah, right we here. we have it right here. Yeah, she has a yeah. Can you read it there, Leah? I can't read it. Don't even bother with me. But I wanted Rosemary to go over this letter. Just she doesn't have to read it, but just Mike, you can even help. Uh, just go over <coughs> the, the bullet points of why. What was the intention behind this letter? Sure, absolutely. And um, yeah. I'm going to let Mike talk for me because I'm getting no, um, no problem a, a bit out of it right now. No yeah, so, problem, my love. Uh, with some, you know, just different. Uh, you know, respiratory issues and things of that nature. When we talk for a long time, it's kind of problematic. No problem. So I guess I'm her, uh, her registered spokesperson. Yeah. He's um, my agent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. agent. He's your Kevin. He's Huvain. my secret agent. <laughs> he's your Kevin Huvain. He's not very secret, I don't, Rosemary. I don't know if that, yeah, it's the cat's out of the bag, mom. <laughs> um, so this, um, when this was, and this is written to specifically Mr. David Miscavige, chairman of the board, religious technology center uh -huh. and to Mr. Tom Cruise, IES Freedom Medal of Valor winner, um, because that is <laughs> oh, apparently brother. the largest uh, honor that has ever been bestowed on anyone in Scientology. So these two individuals, um, as mom and I were talking, there's really no um, person <laughs> other than David Miscavige that is inside of or in charge of Scientology and able to really run the day to day or has any ability to change anything besides him. Right. And then as Tom Cruise is the most outspoken member of the church and is doing or was doing so much to publicize and push the, uh, the messages that um, David Miscavige is coming out with. She thought as we're going through all these different um, abuses that she's had to endure, um, she, she mentioned one day, she's like, I really wish this wasn't the case, but there's still so many people there. Right. So, at this time, when she wrote this letter, they, I don't know if they actually knew she was fully gone or not. They hadn't even stopped her Sea Org pay. And this was the beginning of August of last year. Okay. And um, really what this is, is her calling for one um, change that she would like to see in the organization. Uh -huh. And then also to a plea for them to just leave her alone. Right. And the the request was aimed at trying to start at the lowest level to start a dialogue to see if improvement could be something that we would ever see. And unless, and she was never given a voice. So now that she's able, I'm like, mom, you can say whatever you want to say. That was never an option before for her. So she's like, well, I have things to say. So we, we, you know, put some of this together um, and it is addressed to them. And, and David Miscavige has no question who, Rosemary Brown, uh, which was her <laughs> married name, and Rosemary Chickwalk are. He knows who I am. There's no doubt. Oh, so, very well. Yes, very well. Um, so <laughs> just going through this, Mom, and I'll just kind of uh, touch on a point, and then I'll let you um, put in some input on it as you as you feel like you want to. Okay. Um, but as we're going through these, this is really a call to help her effectuate change within the organization. Um. The first thing has to do with when members <laughs> join the organization being separated from their immediate family, which was right. something that happened with us when I was younger. Yes. I was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. You were then you went to the Estates Project Force, which is the Sea Org Boot Camp. And then you were stationed up at the International Base in Gilman Hot Springs while I was still down in Los Angeles. Right. Right. And so, that's very normal. That's very normal to separate families. This is not great, great ask because to separate families, whether they're, you know, uh, I mean, even younger than you, Mike, it's, 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 mm -hmm. these stories are horrendous to hear. This is a norm for the Sea Org. Okay. Yep. Great Absolutely. point. Okay. And, Separation we, and, of we came from, and we came from a point where before this, where we were very close and living 
kind of in a suburban neighborhood in Colorado before we went to Los Angeles. And right. I mean, what did that feel like for you being uh, in a different location than me? It was like horrible. I was, it makes you feel so, uh, I don't know, dispersed. Like you can't, you're supposed to be doing your work, but you've got your attention on your, you know, your children and stuff like that. And I, of course I, I had just got a divorce, so I didn't have a husband, Right. but that's just horrible being separated from your kids. Right. And especially you don't know how they're getting taken care of or anything. And you can only see them at that time. It was just like maybe an hour and a half a day. That's when we were both in Los Angeles. When we together. were in Los Angeles. Then after that, I would just, if I could get a ride down to LA Saturday night, I would see him for a couple hours on Sunday morning early. Then right. we'd have to drive back for muster by noon. Right. It was just insane. Well, it's it made me a nervous wreck. Of course. But then eventually you you get indoctrinated, right? You get with the program. And the program is it's not really your son. He's just a yeah. soul, you know, a, a soul that's lived many years, many lifetimes. And he's not really your son. He doesn't really belong to you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. They're trying okay. to brainwash me to that. I never could yeah. understand that part. Right. Anyway. And by the way, that didn't really change, Mike B, because even when your mom was – not really in the Sea Org, but under Sea Org control, they still didn't want you guys to have any connection because you weren't uh, with Scientology. They still right. were keeping right. keeping you guys yeah. apart constantly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. It's just oh, it's horrible. No, I know. So, it's I know. the most horrible thing I've ever experienced. So it sounds like a, it sounds like a simple ask and almost like a no brainer. Like that sounds yeah. obvious, but yeah. it is a significant thing in the Sea Organization. This is for us as a, a family, just, you know, mother and son when I was younger, but there are, are married couples that are separated from their spouse, just like sure. it doesn't ever matter. Right. Um, That's every day. That's every day this year. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, the next point had to do specifically with how um, Religious Technology Center, they found out um, mom used to work for an individual named Ron, uh, Ronnie Miscavige. Junior, this is David Miscavige's slightly older brother. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little noisy out in the hallway where we are. I hope it's not coming through too terribly bad. That's okay. But, don't worry about it. Okay, so when um, so, and I, I don't really want to um, have to recount the specifics of this, Mom. But uh, Mom worked for Ronnie Miscavige for about a decade as his uh, basically your, his secretary. Yeah. And uh, there was uh, inappropriate um, relations that we, that are inappropriate workplace assault that I guess you could say that uh, she was subjected to right. um, against her will uh, from Ronnie. And uh, it wasn't discovered until uh, many, many years later when it and was, was Ronnie reported to the police when it was discovered. No, he was. Not. Oh, OK. No, uh, no but, but, discovered but were, by but, RTC. We, we, I was we still in. Punished. Yeah. So, so through his sec checking, the response to that is not to find out that there's an executive that's engaged in quid pro quo activities with his, uh, you know, assistant or secretary, and then to yeah. pull her in and find out if she's okay or give her an advocate or anything right. like that. She was interrogated. And then ultimately she was, made punished. to think that it was her fault and punished and mm -hmm. he was sent back to the job and she was removed of course as though it was her fault right. mm -hmm. of course so right. very the usual, ask on very, this very is usual to, very usual practice for scientology absolutely go ahead so, That's, so they ask is to reform yeah, here and right and victims should never be punished for being able to bring forward um you know information about an assault that they've endured they should be supported absolutely and they should right. be helped absolutely. also not outside of the realm of normal asks in this society on what should be the, the norm for a corporate setting or a church setting, if they want to call themselves that. Right. Um, the next has to do with uh, a very culturally um, charged subject, which has to do with the termination of pregnancies. Uh-huh. Forced um, abortion. Uh -huh. Yes. 
Yeah. And in the C organization, um, my uh, ex-wife and I, she had uh, become pregnant on two occasions. And on both of those occasions, because of where we are, were on that base, we were in the situation where we had no other choice but to terminate the pregnancies and right. to have the abortions. You were forced. So, the, yeah, so forced. regardless mm-hmm. of which side of the aisle <laughs> one might sit on, uh, on if they are supportive matter. or unsupportive, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Shouldn't be forced it's, to get an abortion. And that yeah. happened even in civilian, in the for Scientology civilian young women who were all kind of left to hang out to, you know, by themselves. Their parents were in the Sea Org. They didn't want to be in the Sea Org. There was a bunch of us just hanging out, uh, you know, unsupervised on Fountain Avenue near Big Blue. And abortions were normal. And, uh, you know, Scientology ethics officers were telling everybody, you know, you got to get an abortion. You got to get an abortion. You got to get an abortion. And it it was, it's usual, it's just usual practice in and out of the Sea Org. Yeah. So yep. the, the women's rights being what they are, this should never be a conversation between anyone else other than those individuals. And yeah. it, they should, they should never be forced okay. ever. Yep. Um, yeah. The next thing has to do with uh, when I then shortly after that decided to leave the Sea Org, I blew the Sea Org, which is their, of course, term for unauthorized departure. Mm-hmm. And I was 27 years old and I went out to start my own life and uh, left from there. And um, she was, mom was forced to disconnect from me as was everyone that um, stayed behind there at Golden Air Productions and the International Base. Right. Um, what, what, is, what are your feelings, mom, about like having to oh, break apart our ability to that ha- That's like one of the worst losses I ever had. Right. Um, it took, all I did, I ran around for days crying and crying, you know, because he had left. But nobody would ever talk to me about anything. I just had to keep it all inside. And they packed all of his stuff up, sent it to him. Anyway, it, it, it was the most devastating thing I ever could imagine. And then they burned all of his pictures, his whole existence, right? Yeah, you then, even, then you of were course he was one de- picture. He was declared a suppressive person. Then they, of course, about, he he blew in October 2003. Mm-hmm. Then in March 2004, they packed up a bunch of us from the base and, and uh, sent us, they were getting us ready to send us down to the PAC RPF mm-hmm. or offload us. And they, they burned all of his baby pictures in a big bonfire out at uh, the uh, Happy Valley Ranch where they had me out there with a bunch of others right. um, getting us ready to, to ship us out. Right. And they, they just did that all to all of my stuff. Anyway, it was horrible. Of course. Um, I, I don't even know. I can't even um, tell you how, how much of a loss that was. Of then course. I end up on the RPF and they kill, still keep trying to get me to forget about my son so that I can get auditing and, and uh, finally, and get off the RPF. So right. they still kept, kept trying to deprogram me or whatever, trying to get me to disavow my love for him. So I right. had to just pretend that I forgot about Michael so that I could go through that stupid program. Right. So and, you then, get through. and then why were you even put on the RPF? <laughs> well, I was put on the RPF for out 2 D with Ronnie Miscavige because they couldn't find anything else that I had done. Right. So they, but I so was they, on the shit list for uh, no. David Miscavige had all these people on the offload list and I was there. And this and, is, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're using the word out to D and, you know, I'm not going to explain it cause we'll, we'll put it up, but the, the, this is, uh, how they condition people to accept abuse is yeah. by category, categorizing yeah. sexual abuse as out to D. And, um, I just want to be very clear that there's no such thing. This was a, this was, <laughs> this, this was a crime, that was yeah. committed against you, but they miscategor, you know, they purposely put it in this category of out 2D 
to mm -hmm. evade responsibility for what's happening there. Because um, they so always I say that you have to do something to make it happen, even right. if you don't. It doesn't matter because that's yeah. not the law, right? It, it doesn't matter if I'm walking around in a miniskirt and no underwear. I don't deserve to be raped. I didn't ask to be raped. I didn't do it in another lifetime. And that's why I'm been getting raped now. You know, I don't, I don't know if we're allowed to say rape, Mike, but. Um, <laughs> Probably um, not. Okay. So, <laughs> but we've said it 400 times already. So. Exactly. Well, we could just cut all that. Anyway, that, that anyway, ship has sailed. Know, Actually, nobody does anything to deserve having a crime committed against them, as Absolutely Scientology right. has. Scientology has made it so that yeah. when you're raised in it, indoctrinated into Scientology, this is how they condition their victims: is by using yep. their own nomenclature uh, to miscategorize what's actually happening there, uh, and and also their yeah. own beliefs, because Hubbard yeah. says that. For something Truth. bad, to, that's what Rosemary is saying. For something yeah. bad to happen to you, you had to have done a mm -hmm. similar thing to someone else. So it's always finding out what the victim did that caused them to receive the bad uh, right. result. So right. it's it's a it's a no win. It I, I I analogized it to the witch trials. You know, you get dunked <laughs> in the water. If you drown, you're not a witch. If right. you survive, you are, and you get burned at the stake. Right. And that is the same for a victim of Scientology. Mm -hmm. When uh, it is perpetrated by a Scientologist, particularly a celebrity or senior Scientologist, the victim is subjected to a witch trial of mm -hmm. find out what they did wrong. And once that's found no matter whether it's imaginary or not, that is the end of the story. <laughs> Agreed. Now, yeah. Rosemary, beautiful letter. I think that you are um, incredibly gracious and courageous to have taken the time to write such a letter to Dave Miscavige asking for reform, not for yourself, because you're in the safety now of your son's care. Um, and uh, that that you're asking that of Scientology for people who are remaining there says a lot about you and your character that you are now um, of, of you want to be of service, which is why you got into Scientology in the first place, I'm assuming. Right. Is yes. that right. we all get into it thinking we're going to make the planet a better place um, and we're going to be better people. And that has never uh, they didn't kill that want in you. So this letter, it's uh, a, an extreme example of your character that they didn't squash. <laughs> uh, so, so grateful to you. And again, to Mike, you, uh, B, not Mike Render. He doesn't, he doesn't, he matter. doesn't do anything. He, he just sits there. He just sits looking. there looking gorgeous with his hair, uh, <laughs> with his good hair. Uh, so, you know, it really does say a lot about you and uh, that you have found purpose in your pain is uh, to be commended. Truly. Thank you for your service, the both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I One last thing. Agree more. Don't try to listen, Mark Headley Jr. Don't try to get onto my shit. If you want to say some shit to Rosemary, you could say it on her. Don't. <laughs> Take credit for my beautiful words like you've all taken credit for my fucking bracelet. Okay. Um, I yes, sir. Uh, so, Rosemary, the one thing I want to ask, and then, Mike, we'll get to you. you. You can end off on however you want. But I want to ask you this. Rosemary, what would you say to somebody who was like you uh, on the fringe, wondering if they should be giving up their lives for the bridge, for their eternity, should be giving up knowing their own children, knowing their sons, their daughters, their grandchildren, their mothers, their fathers. What would you say to those people who are still wondering if they should leave? Just take a look at some of the stuff that's there and see if any of it makes any sense to you. And Take it from there. I don't know what else to say. You well, have to just... Very, I mean, look at your life now. 
I mean, do you, I know. Do you, do you see this kind of like um, unconditional love that's coming from your son, right? This is not, this was not something Mike was taught. Scientology didn't teach him this, right? Uh, he loves you and wants to take care of you regardless if you're a Scientologist or not, right? Scientology doesn't have that for any of us, mm -mm. right? Yeah. But if you were maybe to I say, did I misunderstand your question? No, maybe I probably just asked a long-winded question that got lost because I'm a long-winded person. So let me let me try to do it again. <laughs> this is not your fault. This is me, my fault. Uh, what do you do? You what would you say to somebody, Rosemary, who is considering staying in or leaving? There's so much outside of Scientology that is so wonderful. Don't stay another day in there. If you can, if you can get out, get out as soon as you can, because I'm having such a great time having the freedom to be with my son and his wife and my grandkids and my family and not have somebody telling me what I could do and where I could give my love. Right. Just, I mean, I can't imagine staying in a prison when if the door was open, you can go out. Right. Like just take the initiative. I don't know how to get you to look at what's out there, but out here is so nice. Um, I'm so glad I got a, another chance to live because yes. I almost died. And so I feel like, like I'm having another chance to live. So I'm doing that. Thank you I don't so know if I answered your question, but. You answered it perfectly, beautifully. And you so deserve to enjoy every minute of your life. God bless you always. Yeah. And to your son, to your grandchildren, to your daughter-in-law, to you all. And we're here for you if you need anything from us. Thank you for everything you do. You help me get my head back together. And uh, I couldn't have done it without you and Mike for sure. Anyway, okay. thank you I'm for having good. me on the podcast. Oh, my God. Thank you for joining us. Mike, did you want to add anything? I, I just wanted to say, Rosemary, I, you have no idea how happy I am that you have this second chance to live your life. <laughs> really, it is. And, and the fact that, that Leah and I were able to contribute to this happening in some way is what makes my day every day when I hear from people that something that we have done has helped them in their life. That is the greatest joy and sense of accomplishment that I have. And you epitomize that 100% for me. And I love you dearly. And I, I am so happy to see you again. And uh, this has been nothing but an incredible pleasure. And, you know, now I got tears in my eyes. So we're going to end off here. There's something, Leah and Mike, there's something that I want to say before we end off. You know, there's been so much um, goodwill sent to um, me about uh, the video that was done that, that my son Mike Brown did. And they were sending a lot of, you know, um, best wishes and everything on that. But what I really want everybody to do in response to um, my story is if you wanted to give anything, give it all to the aftermath to help other people get out. Because the only way that I got out is when Mike okayed me to, to, be paid by the aftermath to, they paid for my flight from California to Philadelphia and to stay at this senior living. And uh, that that's what I want to send everything to the aftermath foundation for anything that you want to donate. That would be the thing that I would like you to do. Not don't send me anything. I love everything that you 
would like to send that I would like for you to do that if you want to do something to help me in the group. Beautiful. And, and also, and if that makes me. sense, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. You know, the Aftermath Foundation uh, helps a lot of people. But when I heard this story, and, um, and, and, and of course, your son, Mike Brown, had a lot to do with this, Claire Headley, Mark Headley, Mike, you, Mike Rinder, and uh, Rowan. <laughs> Rowan and Rachel, I mean, this was an operation. They had to break her and out. Justin and Justin the Scavage. And Justin. <laughs> Justin I mean, Tompkins. To, I mean, they had to break her out of uh, a facility. Like, it's insane that they had to go through what they had to go through. But the Aftermath Foundation was there to help and facilitate and I think that's a beautiful message to send. It's it's always lovely, like that people want to send you, you know, flowers or, but you're right, you know, fifty dollars, twenty five, it doesn't matter what it is, you know. Rosemary's asking that you send it to the aftermath because of the work they do. So thank you all for that have helped with Rosemary. <laughs>